Hello and welcome back to The Pisky Trap, a series where we explore the folklore, history and legends from across Devon and Cornwall. In this episode we're back in North Devon and the town of Biddeford. And the particular story that I want to focus on has been, well it's been a fascination of mine for quite some time. Years ago I went to university in Exeter and I can remember being near the castle and nearby on one of the walls was a plaque which read the following. In memory of Temperance Lloyd, Susanna Edwards, Mary Trembles of Biddeford, died 1682. Alice Moland died 1685. The last people in England to be executed for witchcraft, tried here and hanged at Heavy Tree. And every time that I would go past that plaque, it always seemed to stand out to me. I think because, well, I was curious. I wanted to know more about this particular case, and I wanted to know more about these women and exactly what happened to them. But of course, shortly afterwards, I moved away and never really got round to looking into it further. It was only when I started the research for this project that the story of the Biddeford witches cropped up on my radar again, and this time I was determined that I was going to delve further and to try and tell their story. I've mentioned this before, but as with anything when you're dealing with real history and real individuals, there's a duty of care there, a sense of responsibility in terms of how you portray these real-life individuals and how you present their story. So I've tried to do as much research as I can and I've been helped along the way, firstly, by Professor Marion Gibson of Exeter University, who was kind enough to sit and chat to me about the subject. And you'll be hearing some of that conversation a little bit later. I'm also relying heavily on two books, really. The first is called The Trial of the Biddeford Witches by Frank Ghent, which is a brilliant book. And a new book, which is fantastic, and that's by historian John Callow, and it's called the Last Witches of England, and I highly recommend it if you're interested in the subject. So this is going to be a slightly longer episode than usual, just because of the sheer amount of information about this case, and this is going to be my attempt to tell the story of these women from Devon, and what happened to them. So here is our next episode, The Biddeford Witches. If I were to say the word witch to you, I imagine that for many of you at least, that would conjure up a certain image. Usually we think of a woman, perhaps dressed in black and sporting some kind of pointy hat, maybe with a broomstick, perhaps even riding a broomstick, and maybe with a black cat thrown in as well. Essentially, the Wicked Witch of the West from shows like Wicked or The Wizard of Oz and that kind of thing. In the modern world, our closest link to the idea of witches as real people is perhaps tied to the practice of what we call Wicca, which is it's quite a new concept, really. An author on the subject, Kelvin Jones, um, has the following to say, and I quote, The modern witch is as chalk and cheese to the traditional proponent of that tradition. The ideas fostered by Gerald Gardner, um, Gerald Gardner is basically considered the father of modern-day Wicca, and others have little to do with the traditional witch and are largely a reinvention of 19th century magical traditions, end quote. So, if we were to go back in time a few centuries, what was different then that made people believe in witches in the first place? And what form did these witches take that makes it so different from our modern perception? 
I put this question to Professor Marion Gibson when we had a Zoom conversation a little while back. Marion is Professor of Renaissance and Magical Literatures at Exeter University and is something of an expert on the history of witchcraft and has written several books on the subject. We spoke about this idea in a little bit more detail. What were people's perception of a witch in the, you know, sort of 400 years ago or in the 17th century? What, what do you think people would have seen as, as a witch then? What did that mean to them? I think you make a really good point about stereotyping because, yeah, people, if you say witch to somebody, people think, oh, you know, an old woman for starters, somebody who's maybe socially isolated, probably a widow, um, somebody who lives on the outskirts of a town, maybe, who, who is seen as marginal or external in some way or other and then they kind of pile on top of that all the sort of disnified elements like you know we'll have a green face we'll wear a pointy hat all of that kind of thing but actually when you look at history which is could be almost anyone they did tend to be women so that part is correct you know about 80 85 percent 90 percent of, of, of the people who were accused of, of witchcraft across Europe in different jurisdictions were women. So it's very likely that, that a witch suspect would be a woman. But she could be almost anybody. You, you have young women suspected. You have women who are widows. You have married women. You have mothers with children, small and, and grown children. And you have women from a variety of social settings. So, yes, you have the isolated woman who is maybe poorer than her neighbours, who's seen as a bit of an out. Cost. But you also have people right at the heart of the community, you know, the, the wives of successful merchants or, or women who run their own businesses or who are farmers. So which is a really diverse and I do think it's important that, that you want to look at that. So we've sort of established that people accused of witchcraft could come from a wide range of, of ages and different backgrounds. What I want to tap into now is the belief in witchcraft and sorcery three or four hundred years ago, I think it can be difficult for us now to comprehend this idea that at one time people genuinely believed in magic and that it could play a part in your everyday life. You've got the idea of what you might call folk magic, um, used for good with you know remedies and advice from people like folk healers or cunning folk as they're basically called. If you're someone who's not able to afford to go to a physician, I suppose you're going to seek out the local cunning person or folk healer for help. Owen Davis, in his book Popular Magic, opens by saying, and I quote, Cunning folk was just one of several terms used in England to describe multifaceted practitioners of magic who healed the sick and the bewitched, who told fortunes, identified thieves, induced love, and much else besides, end quote. There seems to be this idea of, of good magic that can help you and bad magic or black magic that can curse you or harm you. So in the 17th century, at the time of the Biddeford Witches, these people are very real and they can play a part in your life, well, for better or worse. I think that leads us on now to the fear of witches. And people often talk about Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches, which is basically a treatise that was published in the late 1400s, and it explored witchcraft and the idea of the detection of witchcraft as well. And this is often seen as something of a catalyst for a kind of witch-hunting craze that sweeps across Europe. In England, there are various acts and legislations put in place, particularly during the Tudor period, and especially under the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I. And James is often seen as being quite paranoid about the idea of witches. And in fact, he writes a book called Demonology, all about the subject, and introduces this act in 1604 that basically it criminalises witchcraft. And that later becomes enforced by people like Matthew Hopkins, the so-called witchfinder general. So where did this sort of witch hysteria, for want of a better word, come from? And why does it seem to have been such a huge thing, particularly in the 1600s? 
why do you think there was such a a fear of potential witches particularly it seems like the 1600s in particular seems like this sort of hotbed what do you think it is about that that century in particular that means that um we suddenly get witch crazes it for want of a better term springing up why do you think that that suddenly comes about the 17th century is a real hot spot. Um, you get people starting to become interested in witches in England, really, in the 1560s. There have always been witch trials. You know, they've kind of puttered away in the background, sometimes disguised as other kind of trials, but they've been about magic and about fears that women are doing magic. But in the 1560s, there's a new parliamentary act um, which criminalises witchcraft, which pushes it through the criminal court. So you start to get trials taking off then. And by the 17th century, yes, the pace has picked up quite a bit. And especially in the mid-century, with the Civil War that, that of course, rages right across the, the British Isles, you get a lot of community conflict, you get a lot of religious conflict, and there is this sense that the evil has become very present. You know, your neighbours, you think about it this way, your neighbours might be roundheads or they might be cavaliers, but either way, you know that they're different from you. They believe different things, they might have a different sectarian religion, and it's quite easy to move from that position to thinking, yeah, they're actually on the devil's side. And it seems to be something to do with that. There seems to be the sense that you can't trust your neighbours as much as you used to be able to, that you might have significant political differences with them and religious differences. And as part of that, oh, they might be witches. So I think it's I think the 17th century is a dangerous time to be accused of witchcraft and you're quite likely to be accused of witchcraft in that time because it's a time of division as much as anything else. So in Britain, particularly during the time of the Civil War, you, you can perhaps understand why there might be these community conflicts or these religious divides and things going on. But I want to come back now to Biddeford at this point. And there's another thing that's particularly interesting about this case in that it takes place in the 1680s. So that's that's quite a long time afterwards, well after the Civil War. So firstly, what's that all about? Also, personally, I, I tend to think of, if I think of witch trials, I tend to think of rural villages and, and people in a community perhaps suspecting someone of being a witch, maybe because they live on the edge of the community and maybe they've got a bit of a reputation. But to me, I always associate that with rural communities and the idea that people in the countryside are perhaps being more superstitious, if you like. But in this case, we've got several people accused of being witches in somewhere like Biddeford, which is quite a big town with, with quite a lot going on. So I wondered if this was quite unusual. But if it is a bit of a surprise, isn't it, as a, a location, because it's got a lot going for it, really. You know, it's got the sea trade. There are even things like coal mines there. Um, you know, there's a pottery. There's, there's all sorts of, of industry and activity going on. But you do find that communities like that are quite often the site of, of significant witch trials, witch accusations. And it seems to be something to do with that sense of division that I was talking about. You know, in town communities, you do often have a couple of factions or a couple of parties. You know, maybe one group is, you know, they adhere to a particular sect and, and another group over here believes something slightly different. And they do seem to fall out along those sort of lines. So you get quite a lot of towns which are deeply riven by these factions, which again is linked back to the, the Civil War. But also Biddeford seems to go through a bit of an economic crisis in the late late 17th century um, you know things uh, traditional industries start to, to peter out there is concern that the civil war has impacted on some of them um, Biddeford bizarrely is a big weapons manufacturing town and so during the civil war of course that's great but subsequently not so good um, better for everyone else of course but for the weapons manufacturers not so much and, and the coal mines start to the coal mining starts to, to dry up as well 
And in the 1670s, you find that there's a particular kind of economic crisis and some of the, the town's charities aren't doing as well as they were. Some of the town's poorer people are suffering more, therefore. Um, and there's some quite significant population movements. And it, it seems like that all impacts in various ways, leading to these people being accused as, as enemies of the community scapegoats for some of these troubles, if you like. 1680s seems quite late. I know it's sort of 10 years before... Salem, right, in, in the US. But for England, that seems quite late to me. I wonder what your thoughts were in terms of in context. Is that quite late and is that quite unusual? It does seem quite late, doesn't it? It seems quite late to me every time I think about it. Um, because a lot of the work I've done has been on the on the genesis of, of witchcraft prosecutions. And it does constantly surprise me that 100, 120 years after the first witchcraft act, this is still going on. And in fact, seems to have been strengthened in, in some ways. You know, communities seem to have been, and Salem is the classic example, if anything more interested in witchcraft towards the supposed end of the witch hunting period than they were at the beginning. Which is odd. I think we often in history, we look for narratives of progress. You know, we expect things to get better over time. But unfortunately, one of the things that history teaches us is that not everything gets better and that some things, you know, drift back towards being worse again once we think they've been sorted. And I think witchcraft does offer us quite a good example of that. People carry on being persecuted right into the 1680s, 1690s, the, the early 1700s. And it isn't until the 1730s that the, the witchcraft acts of, of the 1560s and 1604 and so on are repealed and even then people carry on believing in witchcraft you know they still do today i want to move on now and delve a little bit further into what happened at biddeford and how this whole case came to trial in exeter everything seems to begin with an elderly woman named temperance lloyd so what do we know about temperance well, uh, very little is the answer, uh, until she starts to appear in the court records later in life. However, historian John Callow speculates that her family may have arrived in Biddeford sometime during the early 1640s, and that they might have perhaps come over from Wales. There's a record of the marriage of a Temperance Jones to a Rhys Lloyd in St Mary's Church, dated the 29th of October, 1648. If this is the same person, which seems quite likely, that would probably put Temperance somewhere in her 60s at the time of these events in July of 1682. By the 1660s, something has obviously happened within her family and Temperance is now on her own and is recorded as being a pauper. Basically, she's claiming charity or poor relief from the parish. It also seems that alongside what happened in the summer of 1682, this wasn't the first time that Temperance had been accused of being a witch. Eleven years earlier, back in 1671, she makes her first appearance at the Exeter Assizes, accused of, and I quote, killing William Herbert by witchcraft, but she's acquitted. Eight years later, in 1679, she's accused again, this time of practising witchcraft upon Anne Fellow, daughter of Edward Fellow, a bit of a gentleman. And she's apparently searched by someone called Cicely Goldsworthy and others, but they don't seem to have taken any further action. It's hard to say exactly what's going on here, but it does seem that Temperance has gained something of a reputation within the community by this point. On Saturday the 1st of July, 1682, she's arrested again. This time, a man named Thomas Eastchurch, who is a Biddeford shopkeeper, has complained to the local constables or the watchmen, who then arrest her, and she's taken to an old chapel on the end of the bridge in Biddeford, where they lock her inside, and she's kept there until Monday morning, when she's brought before the justices. Statements are then made by Thomas and Elizabeth Eastchurch, along with the alleged victim, Grace Thomas, and their neighbours, Anne Wakeley and Honor Hooper. This time Temperance is charged, and I quote, upon suspicion of having used some magical art, sorcery or witchcraft 
upon the body of Grace Thomas, and to have had discourse or familiarity with the devil. It seems that on the previous day, Temperance had been searched by Anne Wakeley along with Honor Hooper and several other local women. Basically, they're looking for what are known as witch marks. In this instance, apparently, and I quote, Upon search of her body, she did find in her secret parts two teats hanging nigh together like unto a piece of flesh that a child had sucked, end quote. So, at this point, I wanted to know a little bit more about this whole process of investigation. Was what's going on here at Biddeford considered standard practice, or to what extent are the community and the local authorities kind of making it up as they go along? Were they following a specific protocol here, or is it just, um, you, you know, how would that have worked, and was the, were they following a specific procedure, I suppose is my question. There is a specific procedure. So you would go to the magistrate in the first instance if you suspected somebody in your community was, was a witch, and you'd do a thing called lay an information against them. So you'd make a statement to the magistrate in which you'd say, you know, I fell out with goody so-and-so and then my child fell ill and I think she's to blame. Please do something about it. And at that point, the magistrate had to get the constables and, and the, you know, the other officials of the town to go and arrest the suspect and to question them. That's the point where other things can happen, can creep in. You know, that's the official procedure. But because people have a lot of theories about how magic works and a lot of theories about who witches are and how you discover who they are, they then sometimes go a bit off piste and decide to do their own thing with them. And among the things that they can do is have their bodies searched. So they would strip search them. And sometimes they would even shave the hair off the body and they would be looking for marks on it so that they would be enabled to determine whether this person was a witch or not. They would have the devil's mark on them. And that could be something like a mole or a, you know, a skin blemish of some sort, or it could be something like a wart or, or a, a hemorrhoid even, you know, some sort of excrescence on the body something that stuck out and they would say well that's that's obviously a teat where the demonic familiar the animal suckles the witch so they would start to find ways of as they thought finding physical evidence finding you know material confirmation of the fact that this person was a witch so what they were doing was really adding to the official procedure by their own investigations and sometimes she, they would also do things like throw the, the woman into water to see if she sank or swam people probably have heard of, of the witch swimming test and if she floated well the water was rejecting her supposedly um, and and she would therefore be considered to be more guilty that wouldn't be the final step you'd have to go on to trial the magistrate would commit the the suspected witch for trial and off she would go and she would be tried at the criminal court the assize court um, and from that she would be found guilty or, or innocent and, and would be punished according to the law but there's, there's a sort of odd mix of, of DIY justice if you like at the local level which sort of shades into a kind of lynch law although it usually doesn't quite get there and an official procedure that you're supposed to follow. So although to me this seems to have hints of mob justice it does appear that they're following a set procedure. But I can't help on thinking that this old woman has been not only locked up over the weekend, but has been effectively strip-searched and is now brought in front of the justices to hear statements made against her by her own neighbours. So what exactly is it that they're accusing her of? Well, there's a number of allegations by different people. I'm going to begin by looking at the testimony given by Thomas Eastchurch, who's the person that first reported temperance to the constables. And all of this is based on things he claims to have heard temperance confess to while she's in the lockup over the weekend. Apparently, she confessed to them that back on the 30th of September the previous year, she'd encountered something in the likeness of a man in black upon the street. This mysterious man basically persuades her to torment Grace Thomas, who is East Church's sister-in-law. At this time, Grace is staying at East Church's house. 
and Temperance says she goes upstairs and she finds Anne Wakeley rubbing Grace's arm and leg. Apparently this mysterious man persuaded Temperance to pinch Grace in her arms, knees and shoulders. On coming back downstairs and into the street, she says that she saw a tabby cat go into East Church's shop and she believed this cat to be the devil. So there's a real mix of things going on here. Basically, it seems that Temperance has been back several times like this, going into the house to torment Grace by pinching her and that kind of thing. But that whenever she goes, she and this mysterious man remain unseen or invisible, basically, to anyone else in the room. East Church's wife, who is Grace's sister, says that she's observed Grace's in some kind of pain and that there were prick marks like thorns on her body. And she suspected some kind of what they call image magic. And they'd asked Temperance if she'd made any kind of figure or effigy, a bit like a voodoo doll, from clay or wood. And Temperance said that she'd had a piece of leather that she'd pricked holes in. Another separate statement was made by Anne Wakeley, who said that on the Thursday last, she, and I quote, did see something in the shape of a magpie to come at the chamber window where Grace Thomas did lodge, end quote, which she obviously found suspicious, and this led her to question temperance about it. And she apparently replied that it was this mysterious man, essentially the devil, in the shape of a bird. When temperance is asked about these supposed teats on her body and whether the devil had sucked at these, she acknowledged that she had, and that the most recent occasion had been two days earlier, on that Friday. Now, Frank Ghent, in his book on this case, says that a lot of these accusations were based on pure hearsay. However, the testimony given by Thomas Eastchurch carries weight because, because basically he's a respected citizen. Alongside all of this is another separate accusation that's brought forward by a man named William Herbert, and he gives his statement, which is a long-standing accusation that dates back to 1671, in which he claims that his father, on his deathbed, had said that, and I quote, Temperance had bewitched him unto death. So there's obviously a long-standing grudge there that goes back a decade. There's a few other accusations, and again, mostly hearsay, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but essentially the list of allegations against Temperance Lloyd is now starting to mount up. Before we go any further, I want to look a little bit further into these stories and these allegations, because, frankly, some of these seem very far-fetched. I mean, this idea that Temperance has made herself invisible just to torment Grace. And then there's this man dressed all in black, who, I should also mention, is described as being only the size of Temperance's arm. And then there's the devil appearing in the shape of, of a cat or a magpie, It's all a little bit surreal, so I wanted to know a little bit more about what's going on in all of these stories and these statements. In the case of, say, again, coming back to Temperance Lloyd, there's mention of, like, the the shape of a magpie or the shape of a cat that's seen. Um, How does that kind of play a part in in, in sort of magic and witchcraft? Animals and birds are really important in English witchcraft thinking. Um, There's two ways that witches could be involved with them. One is that they could be thought to have an animal familiar or a bird familiar or an insect familiar, um, who is a little devil who's supposed to accompany them around and do some of their magic for them. So they might send their familiar to a neighbour to curse them or to touch their child and make them sick. So that's the first way in which they, they could be seen to be involved with animals. But the other way, which sort of blurs into it, is that especially as the 17th century goes on, English people start to think witches can actually transform into animals. So they think about the the woman, you know, becoming a magpie or becoming a cat or becoming a greyhound and following them around their community. So there's also this bizarre slippage between the animal and the human. You've got all sorts of ideas in in that mix. And people have suggested over the years that maybe because English people are crazy about animals and, you know, we love having pets, 
maybe it's part of that. Maybe it's something specifically English. It isn't wholly. There are other communities where transformation into animals is, is also important. You know, you find the same kind of thing in, say, Norway. Um, but it does seem to be a particular focus of English thinking. We, we do seem to be quite obsessed with animals. And so, you know, if you've got a witchcraft accusation, it's perhaps natural that animals have become involved in that in some way. I mean, because I mean, it seems like a bit of a, an unusual thing to try to understand from a modern perspective, because you look at it and you go, and that, that seems very outlandish. It seems very strange. But do you think, uh, because it crops up so often, it, does, it, does that give you a sense that there were these people had, had pets and maybe that's what was misinterpreted? Or was it just animals that happened to be either in a rural community or that were wandering around the streets of the city and their people are reading into it? Mm. Often witches did have pets, yes. So you come across cases where they say, oh, you know, I've got this cat or, um, I, you know, I met this little dog and, and he came home to live with me. So you find that kind of, it is a pet relationship, yes. And, and that does feel quite recognisable to us, doesn't it? There's a lot of uh, stories where people are alarmed that the witch was talking to her animal. And, you know, <laughs> I talked to my cat, I talked to my dog. So... That seems explicable, doesn't it? But also, yes, you're quite right that there would have been a lot of stray animals in these periods. Um, so, you know, in towns and cities, you'd have been quite likely to encounter a dog or a cat that you, you didn't know. Um, and animals were there scavenging. In a sense, they were in the same position as, as the vulnerable humans. They too, you know, needed to eat. They needed somewhere warm to sleep. And the sense that they were sort of breaking into your home and stealing your resources seems to play into some of these stories as well. And there's this theme that, that, that crops up quite a lot, and it's something that occurs in a lot of the, the Essex witch trials as well as um, in this instance, is this theme that recurs of um, these often isolated and, or sometimes elderly women, or not always though, approached by a man often all in black who offers them something. Um, it's the same with this temperance Lloyd. It's kind of, I will help you. I think with Susanna Gregory, it's like almost, I'll help you out of your poverty or this situation if you will do this, if you will cause harm to such and such. I wonder what you, your thoughts were on this because it's this mysterious enigmatic figure and, and you can probably guess who that they're alluding to to an extent, but I wonder what your thoughts are on this sort of recurring theme that crops up. It's a recurring pattern, isn't it? And it happens not only in witchcraft stories, but also in other kinds of stories, like stories about fairies, for example. You know, a mysterious creature approaches you and promises you something. Oh, what do you do? And clearly, in most cases, the thing to do is turn them down and run away. <laughs> but that isn't the story shape, is it? The story shape says, no, no, accept whatever it is is on offer, and then the story will play out as it always does. And, you know, it will all turn out to be a terrible trap, and, and the, the ending will be a cautionary tale about how you should never, never, you know, speak to strangers on the road or take anything from anybody who you don't already know or accept a favour that you can't pay back. All of that kind of thing. It's the something for nothing trope, isn't it? You must never take anything that, that you can't repay in some way because sooner or later the debt will be called in and that, in this case, that will be your soul. And <laughs> You will have found that you've done a very bad thing. Indeed, you made a very poor bargain indeed. But it is an old trope, isn't it? And you can see how it would appeal to people in quite poor communities or people who've been through difficult circumstances like a civil war or like religious conflict, the idea that somebody would offer them something for free, effectively, you know, free, buy one, get one free, the, the, you know, the free offer um, that pulls you into a contract. Even now we can still feel the power of that, can't we? Even though we, you know, we live in, in really comfortable circumstances compared with these people, you can see the power of that offer. And yes, they tell that story over and over and over again, don't they? Yeah, and it, what's really interesting to me is that it's often one that crops up when they um, when they confess, if you like. It's often the story that they give as to like how I became a witch. But what's fascinating to me is that they obviously this is so ingrained as a sort of trope that this is what they recite in confession. Um, that that's what sort of fascinates me is just how how prevalent it was that it recurs in again and again and again. So it must be something 
Do you think it's something that goes back that people are just almost taught this is a cautionary tale from childhood and maybe they recite that? Yes, I think so. I think they've got certain story models in mind. Um, and one of them, yeah, it's the cautionary tale. You know, don't take anything from a stranger. Don't listen to those voices in your head that say everything is going to be all right and you're going to get something free. It's that story. Um, the other thing is that they were probably asked how they became a witch as well. Certainly the cases I've looked at where a question is recorded, quite often somebody will say, either out of sheer curiosity or as a kind of conversational icebreaker in the interrogation. Oh, so how did you become a witch? And it's one of those questions that assumes you are a witch. So it puts the person you're asking the question to in a very difficult position. How are they going to answer that? Mm. They can't necessarily say, but I'm not a witch. They have to possibly go along assent if they want to please the questioner so at that point the, you know the story is triggered they they start thinking well I became a witch when I met that fine gentleman who offered me something and you know if you're a woman the, well, the thing the fine gentleman offers you is probably going to be in exchange for some sort of sexual favor women would have found themselves in that position really quite often if they were poor women and so, of course, that's the story you come out with. You've got the model there waiting, haven't you? The fine gentleman who offers you something, the strange creature who offers you something, the fairy who offers you something, as in the old folk tale. And you just trot out the story because you think that's what you're supposed to do. Temperance appears to have admitted to all the charges, however outlandish they were. And she also confessed to causing the death of a woman named Lydia Berman, along with Anne Fellow, and of bewitching out one of the eyes of Jane, who was the wife of a mariner. So, having confessed to all these charges in front of the justices, she's then committed to jail in Exeter to await the assizes. As a little side note, it seems to have been noted that as soon as Temperance had been placed in that lock-up on the bridge that weekend, Grace Thomas's pains had suddenly stopped. While Grace Thomas seemed to be recovering, around that same time, another woman, also called Grace, had become ill, and her condition was taking a turn for the worse. And this leads us on to the case against two other women from Biddeford, Mary Trembles and Susanna Edwards. Just a few days after Temperance Lloyd is sent to jail in Exeter, on Sunday the 16th of July, a woman named Grace Barnes's illness had become so bad that, and I quote, four men and women could hardly hold her. It's unclear exactly what this condition was, but clearly the symptoms included some kind of convulsions or spasms, which means she's having to be held or restrained in some way. During all this commotion at Grace's house, Mary Trembles happens to be passing. A woman called Agnes Whitefield is a neighbour who's been called in to help with Grace, and she hears someone at the door, and she opens it to find Mary Trembles standing there with a white pot in her hand. Now Mary says that, it being a Sunday, she's carrying her Sunday meal in a pot to be cooked at the communal oven. But her accusers later say that this was basically a ruse to disguise her malevolent intent. On being told who is standing outside, Grace Barnes says that Mary is one of the people who is basically tormenting her and causing her current condition. And so two days later, on Tuesday the 18th of July, Mary Trembles is reported to the authorities and subsequently arrested, together with a woman named Susanna Edwards. So, what do we know about these two women? Susanna Edwards seems to have been a local woman, uh, we think born around 1612, so she was around 70 at this point. We think she was the illegitimate daughter of Rachel Winslade. And John Callow says, and I quote, The disgrace of Rachel, known to all in the town, must have marked the family out within a close-knit and cohesive society, dominated by Puritan values, 
as disorderly and dangerous, end quote. So it wasn't necessarily the best of starts for Susanna in the community. And over the years, she seems to have lost members of her family, either to plague or to illness. And even before her husband dies in 1662, she's already claiming poor relief. And later on, it seems that she, together with Mary Trembles, would go out and the two of them would be begging in the streets together. As for Mary herself, we don't have a huge amount of information, other than that she was a widow. Again, she's frequently recorded as applying for charity, and John Callow speculates that she may have come from a family who'd migrated over from Ireland. Again, we think she was probably in her 60s by the time of the trial. So, coming back to July of 1682... Grace Barnes' husband accuses Mary Trumbulls of harming his wife, and another man named William Edwards accuses both Mary and Susanna, claiming to have overheard a confession made by Susanna. So, in exactly the same procedure to temperance, both women are placed in the lock-up and they're questioned by the locals. Presumably under this kind of pressure, it seems that Mary then blames Susanna. Anthony Jones, who is present during what I imagine is an interrogation, notices that Susanna, who's probably confused and terrified at this point, did, and I quote, gripe and twinkle her hands upon her own body. And he basically takes this as a sign that she's actively in the process of bewitching someone, and he accuses her outright, saying, Thou devil, thou art now tormenting some person or other. He then leaves to go and help fetch Grace Barnes, who's basically being brought in to meet the accused women and to make her statement. And at some point during this, when they're out on some steps, Anthony suddenly cries out to his wife, and I quote, I am now bewitched by this devil. And according to the reports, forthwith leapt and capered like a madman and fell a shaking, quivering and foaming, and lay there for the space of half an hour like a dying or dead man, end quote. After this pretty dramatic moment, the two justices then examine Mary Trembles, who makes a full confession and basically blames Susanna for initiating her into witchcraft. Susanna is then questioned in a very similar way, and confesses to a series of charges, including tormenting a woman named Dorcas Coleman, And people hear her confess that she's been suckled by the devil, and a few other allegations along those lines. The women are then searched before being sent off to Exeter as well. Something that really stands out to me in the case of these two women, as well as with temperance, is that they're all described as being particularly impoverished. And it seems at times that they're out begging for bread and meat, and they are refused by their neighbours. Frank Ghent points out that 1682 was a year of particular shortages and food was really scarce, so there's good reason why they're out begging, and you could argue that there's good reason why people might refuse them as well if they themselves are are struggling. There are accounts of when their attempts to get food fail, they resort to begging for a farthing's worth of tobacco, and again, they're refused, and they end up going away obviously very unhappy and very discontented, And then when Grace Barnes is suddenly taken ill that night, that's when the women come under suspicion. This to me is starting to sound like a neighbourly dispute that's just got seriously out of hand. But what also interests me here is that all the accounts say that these women freely confessed to all the allegations. But what I have to wonder is how much were these confessions extracted from them in some way? How much are are they uh, using certain tactics to extract a confession to an extent? Because I know you get sense from people like Matthew Hopkins that there's techniques of like walking, which you get senses basically they're almost sleep deprived or just kept walking back and forth until they say what you want to hear. How much in these kind of um, circumstances would people have had like a knowledge or a set way of working and how much um, it's hard to know, I suppose. But was there an element of like intimidation or interrogation going on that might have played into this? 
it's really easy to intimidate somebody when you've got them in that sort of situation. You know, their freedom has been taken from them. They've been accused of something terrible. Their neighbours have turned against them. They're already psychologically in a really bad place. Um, and if you then refuse to allow them to sleep, like the witch finder general Matthew Hopkins did, and you keep them walking up and down the room, and maybe you intimidate them in other ways. Maybe you say nasty things to them. Maybe you... you Maybe you beat them, maybe you hurt them. You're not always going to recall that you've done that. But we do find that some people, like the witch finder Matthew Hopkins, records quite proudly the things that he's done to get them to confess. And he thinks he's doing that for, for good reason. You know, his idea is we will get to the truth. If you break this person's resistance down, they will eventually tell you what the truth is, which is, of course, that they're a witch. Um, he doesn't see himself as doing anything wrong. But of course, to us, that just simply looks like the intimidation of an already very vulnerable person. And it explains completely why people would confess. You don't need to torture people formally. You don't need to get out the rack and thumb screws to make somebody say that they're a witch or confess to anything you want them to confess. You just put them in a position where they feel very vulnerable and they try to go along with what you want. And it's quite possible that that happened to the Biddeford witches. Temperance Lloyd had been sent to the jail in Exeter on the 8th of July. And a few days later, on the 19th, Mary and Susanna were also sent there to wait for their trial. Now, something I should say is that at this point, the courts travel around in circuits around the country. So they basically have to wait until the next assize session comes to Exeter so that the judges can come and deal with the case in that particular region. Eventually, the trial takes place on the 14th of August at Exeter Castle. And this case seems to have drawn quite a lot of attention from all over. There's an account of the trial by a man named Roger North, who wrote, and I quote, The women were very old, decrepit and impotent, and were brought to the assizes with as much noise and fury of the rabble against them as could be showed on any occasion. The stories of their acts were in everyone's mouth, end quote. The two judges at this particular assizes are Sir Francis North, and Sir Thomas Raymond. Now, Sir Francis North comes across as someone who's quite sceptical about the idea of witchcraft by this point, and we get the sense that he's not too keen on the idea of trying suspected witches. Roger North, who, as well as being present at the time, was actually the brother of Sir Francis, said that he, and I quote, dreaded the trying of a witch. And according to Frank Ghent, Sir Francis had already been involved in a witch trial earlier that year, where his scepticism basically led to them being acquitted. However, it seems that at this point he wasn't a very well man, and he was going to be taking a bit of a step back, and he was going to be dealing with the civil cases, leaving all of the criminal cases, such as this one, to Thomas Raymond. And we get a sense that Sir Francis was a little bit anxious about it, and worried that Thomas Raymond was basically going to be content to let these women go to the gallows. When they get to the courtroom, Temperance Lloyd is called up first, and the indictment is read out, and the clerk apparently read the following, and I quote, Thou art here indicted by the name of Temperance Lloyd, late of Biddeford, widow, for that thou didst bewitch Lydia Berman unto death, and that thou didst by witchcraft consume the body of Grace Thomas, end quote. They then ask how she pleads, and there's a bit of a variation here in one of the accounts, she owns all of the charges against her. But in the official court record, all three women that day plead not guilty. The other two women go through exactly the same process, where the indictments are read out, Susanna is charged with bewitching Dorcas Coleman, and Mary trembles for bewitching Grace Barnes. Each of the witnesses then come forward to give their evidence, even though a lot of it, it just seems to be based on hearsay. But at that time, it seems that was perfectly acceptable as evidence and that would hold up. Especially if you add into the mix this idea of unnatural marks on the body and that there have been confessions made as well. But alongside this, Frank Ghent goes on to say, and I quote, In addition to the evidence presented against them, the accused also spoke to the court, freely confessing their crimes, end quote. 
And if that's the case, I have to wonder why, why they would admit to all these charges. To what extent is there um, instances where people kind of almost believe they have a power and how much is it that they are just saying what they need to say because they've been put under duress or potentially uh, intimidated? I wonder what your thoughts were on that, really. This idea of free confession is always interesting, isn't it? How free is what mm. you really want to say, isn't it? Um, yeah, it, it can appear that somebody started to volunteer the information. And I've always thought that could happen for a variety of reasons, one of which is the one that we've just talked about, which is that pressure was put on them. But the other one is also quite interesting, which is that they might think that by confessing, they're moving into a position where they'll be let off. You know, if you perhaps volunteer this information, and this probably applies to, to earlier witches than the Biddeford ones. You know, if you were a medieval Catholic, which goes on into, you know, the 1530s in, in England, if you confessed, it was fine. So if you, if you had religious opinions that were in that sort of spectrum, confessing is fine you're just absolved and then you can go um but of course if you as you move into the protestant era and and as you move into a, a, an area where you're confessing to an actual crime which is judicially defined confession is the one thing you must not do so i think there's confusion amongst people who aren't terribly well educated don't know a lot about religion don't know a lot about systems of justice about whether confession is actually a good thing or not. And it's always interests me what that balance is. Yeah, what is a free confession? How free is it? And if it does look free, well, why might people do it? And it might be for religious reasons. It might be because they want to go along with what they think is the proper behaviour in such a circumstance. Because it's an interesting one in the sense that you get sometimes cases, I was reading a little bit about the Pendle witches, and there's one of the girls who thinks... Um, Alison Davis, because she's the one who's sort of accused of bewitching this peddler who is, it clearly sounds like he had a stroke or something during the course of an argument, but that she's almost spooked by the fact that she might have bewitched him. And so there's this sense of, am I, did I do it? You know, that mm. there's obviously this maybe ingrained belief in magic enough to think maybe I did do it. Do, do you think that that sometimes plays a factor or is it generally the case that, People are so intimidated that they'll they'll confess effectively. Some people did think that they were witches. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you were a cunning person, you were probably quite accustomed to the idea that you could lift off spells and therefore you could cast them as well. Um, I think we do underestimate the amount that people thought they were capable of. So it's quite possible that, that some of the, the Biddeford witches confessed because they thought, yeah, I was angry with so-and-so, my neighbour, or with that child. Um, and, you know, I did curse them, actually. I did say some horrible things about them and I, you know, called down the wrath of the devil on them and, and I went home really angry. Um, what if you lived in a world that was so magically steeped that you thought you might might possibly by saying those words have bewitched them so there's always the prospect that they might have confessed because they thought they were witches as well as their accusers thinking they were witches so some interesting points there in terms of trying to understand the mindset of these women at the time and this leads me on to something that roger north actually commented upon in his account at the time and i quote the judge made no nice distinctions as to how possible it was for old women, in a sort of melancholy madness, by often thinking in pain and want of spirits, to contract an opinion of themselves that was false, and that their confessions ought not to be taken against themselves without a plain evidence that it was rational and sensible, no more than that of a lunatic or distracted person. But he left the point upon the evidence fairly, as he called it, to the jury, and they convicted them. End quote. So North comes across as very critical of the judge, who asks the jury for their verdict, which is returned as guilty on all charges. Sir Francis North later writes a letter to the Secretary of State, stating the following, and I quote. 
Here have been three old women convicted for witchcraft. Your curiosity will make you inquire of the circumstances. I shall only tell you that what I had from my brother Raymond, in this instance he's referring to the other judge, before whom they were tried, that they were the most old, decrepit, despicable, miserable creatures that ever he saw. A painter would have chosen them out of the whole country for figures of that kind to have drawn by. End quote. So, in other words, in their physical appearance, they almost embodied the stereotypical image of a witch. And he goes on to say, The evidence against them was very full and fanciful, but their own confessions exceeded it. They appeared not only weary of their lives, but to have a great deal of skill to convict themselves. Their description of the sucking devils with saucer eyes was as natural that the jury could not but choose to believe them. So, Temperance Lloyd, Mary Trembles, and Susanna Edwards are all sentenced to be hanged. Now, something that Frank Ghent points out is that Francis North writes this letter to the Secretary of State, who has the power to authorise a reprieve, but in this letter North advised against doing so, and he gives his reasons why. Sir, I find the country so fully possessed against them that although some of the virtuosi may think these the effects of confederacy, melancholy or delusion, and that young folks are altogether as quick-sighted as they who are old and infirm, yet we cannot reprieve them without appearing to deny the very being of witches, which, as it is contrary to the law, so I think it would be ill for His Majesty's service, for it may give the faction occasion to set afoot the old trade of witch-finding that may cost many innocent persons their lives, which the justice will not prevent. End quote. In other words, they can't reprieve them because they fear it will prove so unpopular it's going to lead to an uprising. And there's been a lot of political strife in recent years, so they obviously don't want to rock the boat. So much as people like Sir Francis might have disliked the verdict and witch trials in general, these women were going to be executed. On the 25th of August 1682, the three women were taken to the traditional execution site at Heavytree, which is to the east of the city. Apparently Mary Trembles was, quite understandably, very resistant, and we're told that she had been, and I quote, very obstinate and would not go, but lay down, insomuch that they were forced to tie her upon a horseback, for she was very loath to receive her deserved doom, end quote. In stark contrast to that, Temperance Lloyd is described as going to Heavy Tree, eating and seemingly unconcerned. Historian John Callow speculates that maybe having been deprived of food and struggled for so many years, maybe now she was making the most of it on her final day and of, of having a full stomach for once. Around this time, there's a tradition of people going to the gallows and making a confession or giving a speech to the crowd Often they're urged to repent and to ask God's forgiveness. But in this instance, I mean, it can be a bit of a jumble trying to ascertain exactly what happened on the day and what was said in their final moments, because later ballads and pamphlets are often quite heightened and exaggerated, basically for dramatic effect. There are accounts that there was some kind of a squabble that broke out on the gallows between two of the women, and most historians think it was probably between Mary and Susanna. When they're questioned about a charge of bewitching or damaging ships and boats, Mary replies, and I quote, No, master, t'was she, referring to Susanna, who then turns on Mary and says, She was the cause of her bringing to die, for she said when she was first brought to jail, if that she was hanged, she would have me hanged too, end quote. In the words of John Callow, Each in turn denied sexual congress with the devil, or having had familiars that sucked at their teats, though they all admitted having met the devil in various shapes and forms. End quote. Mary Tremble seems to have managed to compose herself a bit by this point, and is quoted as saying, I have spoke as much as I can speak already, and can speak no more. 
Susanna is said to have made a final request that the reverend sing part of the 40th Psalm, and her last words were said to have been, My sins be as red as scarlet. The Lord Jesus can make them as white as snow. Susanna was then pushed off the gallows to hang, closely followed by Mary Trembles. It seems that temperance had been regarded as the sort of ringleader or chief witch, if you like, and the sheriff continues to ask her questions and, I'm assuming, is trying to get some kind of final confession. If that's the case, I think John Callow puts it quite well and really sets the scene for temperance's final moments when he says, There was little dignity left and little or nothing to be gained through this particularly callous final interrogation. Yet still the sheriff persisted and took the chance to berate her for being looked on as the woman that has debauched the other two and who had served a very bad master. Temperance Lloyd ventured nothing that was new and, save for the hurt that she had caused Grace Thomas, denied everything of substance that was put before her. Finally, having attested to her belief in God and Jesus, she begged a pardon for her sins before she too stepped off the ladder plummeting downwards before being jerked backwards with a snap of the rope to swing and sway over those, both great and small, who had known only of her reputation and who had come to despise her and to desire to witness her end. End quote. So that is perhaps as close as we can get to knowing the final moments of these three women who had obviously gone through so much in their lives and had been subjected to so much at the hands of their own community. Unfortunately, the execution of these three women didn't mark any kind of an end to belief in witchcraft. Those fears and those superstitions seemed to have carried on well into the 18th century. That leads us on to a fourth person that I named at the outset, a woman named Alice Moland or Molland, who was also tried and convicted at Exeter three years later in 1685. She seems to have been charged with practising witchcraft on the bodies of Joan Snow, Wilmot Snow and Agnes Furs, and was sentenced to death. However, the information that comes down to us is simply because it's recorded in the jail delivery book, but there's no pamphlets and there's no ballads. There's actually nothing else that mentions Alice's story or even the events of her execution. And that, to me, that seems unusual. And that's led historians to speculate as to what actually happened to her. Is there a chance that this time around someone actually did appeal on Alice's behalf and that she was maybe offered a reprieve? It's very difficult to say. John Callow writes the following. Without the survival of any further documentation, it is impossible to say for sure, but it would seem unlikely that the hanging of a further witch at Hevitry should not have elicited an account in a contemporary diary, letter, chapbook, pamphlet or ballad. Bearing this in mind, it is possible to suggest that Alice Moland did not hang, but was quietly released from the dungeon underneath Exeter Castle and slipped back into the quiet but welcome obscurity from which she had come. End quote. We can only speculate, really, as there's no information on Alice, so we'll never know for sure exactly what happened to her. Coming back now to that plaque that I mentioned at the beginning, which sparked my whole personal interest in the story of the Biddeford Witches. There's a line at the end which reads, In the hope of an end to persecution and intolerance. Now, We've talked a bit about people's belief in witches and in sorcery and that three or four hundred years ago magic played a genuine part in people's lives and so I can sort of start to understand to some extent that there might have been this fear of, of witches in your own town or in your own community. But to me, as someone looking back at this from the 21st century, these women were very much victims of the society in which they found themselves. The series of events throughout each of their lives, a lot of it out of their control, whether it's plague or the decline of industry or family breakdowns or the way that they're perceived by their neighbours because of, maybe because of who they are. 
perhaps because they've come from elsewhere and are maybe still seen as outsiders, or because of the way that they've lived, not necessarily of their own choosing, perhaps because they were poor or because they were dependent on their neighbours. But ultimately, those neighbours turned against them. To me, this case is something that's often overlooked, overshadowed a little bit by the Salem witch trials or the Essex witch trials or even the Pendle witches. But I think the case of the Biddeford witches is something that we shouldn't forget as part of our history here in the Southwest and should be a reminder perhaps of, of just how powerful and maybe how dangerous superstitions and folklore can be. Thanks for listening. I'd like to thank Professor Marion Gibson of the University of Exeter, and I suggest checking out the fantastic books by John Callow and Frank Ghent, and you can find all the details of those and some of the other sources by checking out the reading list for this series. The Pisky Trap is hosted by me, Keith Wallace, with music by Elizabeth Westcott, and original artwork by Caris Harrington. <laughs>